Greetings. It is time to check on one of our most important metrics of technological progress, which is the progress of computational power, and that is best measured through supercomputers. And I did an update for this in the first half of 2022, and now it's time for our second half of 2022 update on supercomputing computational power progression. The reason why supercomputers are the purest metric of technological progress is because these are enterprise-grade products. Most people have never seen a supercomputer, but if you were to visit a supercomputer facility, it would just be a large building full of racks and racks of computers with hallways in between. There's nothing fun to look at or anything fun to even do over there. And since a supercomputer's customers are only other large organizations, it does not have to be productized the way a consumer product has to be productized. A supercomputer doesn't have to care about look and feel. It has far fewer constraints in terms of size and energy consumption. It obviously has some constraints, but it has a lot fewer than any consumer product. It doesn't need a marketing campaign. It doesn't have to have nice colors. It doesn't have to be pleasant to the touch. It doesn't have to have a nice industrial design and things like that. Therefore, no engineering decision-making trade-offs have to take those factors into account. And all of the focus can be in squeezing out the maximum performance relative to the cost budget and energy consumption constraints that are required. Therefore, supercomputing power progresses in a purer sense of computational power measurement. Also, the supercomputers of the world are all benchmarked against each other and a list of all the top supercomputers is assembled. Therefore, we can look at the sum total of computational power of all of the top 500 supercomputers in the world and see that total as an even more decentralized measurement of computational progress. This is a website called top500.org and it updates and maintains a list of the top 500 most powerful supercomputers in the world and has done so for a couple of decades. And this website will be in the description box below. So we scroll down to this chart over here. There are three lines on this chart. The horizontal axis is, of course, time, and the vertical axis is logarithmic, and this is computational power as measured in floating point operations per second. Flops, teraflops is trillions of floating point operations per second, petaflops is quadrillions, and exaflops is quintillions, or 10 to the 18th power. Now of these three lines, the middle line, the orange, is the least interesting of the three. That is just the power of the most powerful supercomputer in the world at any given time. So this line is more of a staircase function and more blocky. But that's only that one supercomputer, so it's not all that important. Right now the most powerful supercomputer in the world has 1.1 exaflops of power, which is a significant step up from the entry before that, which was less than half of that amount. The blue line is number 500 on the list. So the orange line is number one, the blue line is the number 500, and every other ranking position between number one and number 500 resides between these two lines. This blue line is also not that interesting, but it's more interesting than the orange line because no supercomputer aspires to be exactly at number 500. Are they gonna be number 499, 501? They don't know. This just tells us where the cutoff of the line resides, and therefore this is more natural because nobody is striving for a world record like they are with the number one slot. And this is flattening, and I'll talk about the implications of that. But the most important line is the green line. That is the sum of all the top 500. So this orange one and this blue one are both included in here, as is everything in between. The orange one at 1.1 exaflops out of the sum of 4.4 exaflops means that the number one supercomputer comprises 25% of the power of all of the top 500 supercomputers. And the other 499 comprise the other 75%, all the way down to 1.6 petaflops which is pretty low. In fact, it's only a little more than 1,000th the power of the topmost one at 1.1 exaflops. But the green is what we're interested for this video. And as you can see, the top 500 supercomputers combined are 4.4 exaflops. In 1993, the top 500 combined were only 1.1 teraflops, which is much less than even the number 500 supercomputer today. In fact, something that doesn't even qualify as a supercomputer today 
was nonetheless as powerful as all of the top 500 supercomputers in the world combined in 1993. And we know things like that because of Moore's Law and other exponential trends. But this is actually more than Moore's Law because it can be pushed ahead by spending more money and other implications of that. So this total was gaining 10x, not every five years as one might expect through Moore's Law, but every four years, all the way up to around 2013. And then something happened the trend line started to get flatter because that's when the existing paradigm of computation began to saturate and we started to lose ground relative to the long-term technological trend lines. So now we scroll down this web page to the chart right below this and they put trend lines in these three lines. Now, I don't know why they had to make two separate charts rather than just put trend lines in the first chart or a little checkbox that you could select or deselect to show the trend lines. But here are the trend lines of these three lines. However, I don't like these trend lines because they're validating the deviation from the original trend line and trying to normalize that and make that acceptable. This is a lowering of expectations and it is not telling us about where we really should be. Therefore, I have made my own chart that assumes we did not have to underperform relative to the trajectory we were on since 2013. So we'll pull up my chart.